Yeah, so I'm Amaury Suchet. I'm the lead developer of Bitcoin EBT. Thank you. Uh, next is Shama Chancellor. Hi, I'm Shama Chancellor. I, uh, I'm one of the maintainers for Bitcoin ABC, um, mainly focusing on uh, refactoring and cleaning up the code. Thank you. And uh, next is Jason B. Cox. Hi, I'm Jason, a uh, software engineer working on Bitcoin Cash. I started uh, volunteering back in November. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on refactoring RPC and improving uh, our ability to move faster in that area. Okay. Uh, next is Anthony Ziegers. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Anthony. I'm. Uh, I don't know. I guess I've been around to help trying to be involved with big block stuff for a while. I was a founding member of, of Bitcoin Unlimited, and then when I and then I knew once I saw Maury was working on Bitcoin ABC. Um, I, I've been trying to help him out with that ever since I found out about that, which was pre-fork. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to help out with ABC. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Um, the gentlemen from ABC are joined by Chris Passia. So, Chris, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I am the, um, I guess, lead uh, backend developer for Open Bazaar. Uh, also recently started a Bitcoin Cash implementation called uh, BCHD, which is um, so far me and, and Josh Elithorpe working on it. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Jonathan Tumim. Uh Hi, uh, Jonathan Tumim with an M at the end. Right. Um, it's okay, uh, most people misspell it. Um, so yeah, I've been in, in the Big Blocks community for uh, quite a while, basically since the early Bitcoin XT days. Um, so I was an, uh, one of the contributors to Bitcoin XT, um, also helped found the Bitcoin Classic project. Um, and recently I've been active as sort of a scientist slash developer for Bitcoin Cash, uh, trying to look at um, data that uh, uh, measure the effects of some of the proposals and uh, looking at ways that we can make Bitcoin Cash better. And I'm mostly focused on scalability, but I do also have some interest in the uh, check data um, to verify stuff. Great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, the next guest is Guillermo Letty uh, from yes. Bitprim. Yes, I work for Bitprim. We have a full node implementation that is going to follow the ABC changes. So I'm here to represent another implementation and and the people can see that it's not only an, an ABC hard fork that some other nodes are going to follow their chain. We also at Bitprim help ABC with all their testing. We set up the testnet, the explorers, uh, Apple and Bitcore patch to their nodes so the community can test their nodes before the hard fork. Thank you very much, Palermo. So without any further ado, I think we'll just go into the questions that we have had so far presented. Uh, the first one is on CDS, um, and it is, what are some interesting use cases for CDS that you're aware of? Uh, anybody want to take that? I can. Um, so uh, check data sig verify allows, uh, on a, a basic level, for oracles. Um, if anybody's familiar with like Ethereum and uh, the way that they um, approach getting data from the real world into the blockchain, it's usually by having some semi-trusted oracle that will sign messages uh, stating things like the current exchange rate of ETH to USD is X. Um, so uh, opted check data sig verify allows for that kind of signature. That's a, a third party signature uh, to be included as data and uh, for the, the transaction's uh, validity to, to depend on having a signature like that. Um, one of the specific use cases that I'm particularly interested in is that you can use uh, Check Data Sig Verify to have a third party which verifies uh, some sort of identity token or some sort of proof of identity. Like uh, some, some, somebody could do two-factor authentication on a phone number and you could uh, set up a script that would effectively allow somebody to send money to a phone number in a trustless fashion uh, with, or semi-trustless fashion, uh, only trusting that this third party is going to accurately verify that uh, the phone number belongs to that person. You can also do this with an email address or something like that. 
And with it, you can set it up so that the, the uh, Oracle cannot steal the funds, that um, the recipient uh, also gets a direct message through the phone number, which they need in order to uh, reclaim it. But uh, nobody else who's eavesdropping can steal the funds either. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it that way. We're just scratching the surface right now. Um, but I think it's really exciting. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Anthony, did you have a comment on that as well? Uh, yeah, sure. I guess I kind of, uh, maybe I'll start by talking about the background. Like I helped coordinate review for this and, and write the spec. So um, basically like every, if everyone is familiar with objectsig, like every Bitcoin node and wallet has to implement objectsig, which basically it does two things. It calculates, it takes a bunch of information from a transaction and hashes it. And then it checks, and then it checks a signature of that hash. So, um, and it does using like an ECDSA signature check. So basically all up check data sig does is it does the second part, but not the first part. So you, it, it does everything exactly the same as up check sig. It just checks an ECDSA signature, same format, same. So, so basically that part's already implemented in every wallet. It has to be so that you can check transactions. Um, but then you can pass in any, any other, some other data other than the sig hash from a transaction. Basically that means that you can do, a, you, it's fairly flexible. Like um, you can do, you can pass in external information um, from an oracle or something, but you could also, John Tuman mentioned the thing about check, like um, ID, but basically any, you can pass in a PGP signature, it turns out, as long as it's an ECDSA signed thing. So basically you can check if, if something has been signed that, that could be Maybe it was not really even intended as a Bitcoin thing, but you can check whether that signature is valid. Um, and another one that, I, that I've heard of is uh, Omni came up with a thing where you can, you can basically pass in SIG hashes from other transactions to see if, they, see if other transactions have been signed. So he, he's using that for a thing where you can have two different, you can see if two different um, transactions have been signed that come from the same, um, I guess from the same output. I'm not sure exactly what it does, but basically it's, it proves that you have a double spend. So yeah. you can make a transaction that detects if something has been double spent and then can do something based on that. So I think in his case, he uses it as a forfeit kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's actually to incur discourage uh, double spends. Do you want so, me to like, also, expand on that if you want? Sure. Um, so yeah, the Omni proposal is that you have, so you've got some parent transaction and uh, let's say somebody tries to do a double spend attempt. So you've got transaction A and transaction B. Um, with uh, the signatures from transaction A and transaction B, we can have a transaction C that uh, the double spender pre-sent to a certain uh, script and uh, transaction C depends on op check data sig verify on uh, two different sig EC, ED, e, uh, elliptic curve signatures from uh, that parent. So you can take transaction A signature, take transaction B's uh, signature, stick that into uh, the redeem script for transaction C, and then all of a sudden this double spender has lost their life savings or as much as uh, their deposit is. So it, this provides a crypto economic incentive for people to not uh, double spend and it allows vendors to say, oh, you have this deposit, you're going to lose big if you try to double spend. So I can, to some extent, trust that you're not going to try. Um, the one drawback of this is that the forfeit money goes to miners. It does not go to uh, the store or whatever that had the double spend attack against them. So it is really a crypto, crypto economic uh, proof, but it's still uh, probably uh, quite good. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it get implemented. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, just before we go on to the next question, would anybody else like to address this question? Uh, yeah, I also think uh, I've heard of a use case from Almani about uh, potentially doing cross-chain swaps using it. Um, basically what Anthony was talking about where you can supply a signature from another transaction. You can also do that across chains with compatible signatures. Uh, so that's another pretty interesting use case. Like Dash or, or other things like that. 
like Quenya. Part of the design, like when we did the review of it, was to try to make it more more generic. So it's kind of I think it's a pretty good sign that there's these use cases that like we didn't necessarily anticipate that are cropping up. So hopefully there'll be more in the future. All right, I'll move on to the next question, which is related. Uh, what's the difference between this and Andrew Stone's original data sig verify? Would like to take that question. I, I can. I guess I can talk about that. Um, basically, the, the the main the major difference. There's a, there's one basically major difference, and that's that's kind of what I talked about before. Is it's it's, it's essentially exactly the same as op check sig. So in Andrew Stone's proposal, the signature format was was a little bit different, um, and maybe it's I mean it's debatably maybe it was better or who knows, but it was it used it used the the signature method that is in the that you can use to sign a message in the, in the wallet, in Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin ABC, um, but that's different. It has some differences from the signature format and op check sig. So basically the main thing that, that came out of the review is that everyone or, or almost everyone thought it was a good idea to basically mirror op check sig exactly in terms of how it how the signature format is. Um, because that's because it's gonna be a consensus thing and uh, um, it's just a lot safer basically. It's a more conservative thing to do. But the interesting thing that came out of that is that, like that, that's it's sort of funny because now it actually turns out that it it seems like it's actually more powerful this way because because of how we mentioned like now you can pass in sig hashes from other transactions and stuff like that. Um, so so it brings it like creates these interesting ideas about maybe cross chain types of conditions and stuff like that. Thanks, Anthony. Is there, there any other? There were a few other minor things, but that was the major. The major difference. Okay. Anybody else like to address the question? No. Okay. We'll move on to the next question, which is come in. Um, this is regarding CTOR, and I will throw it out there and read it. Um, what is the um, <laughs> Bitcoin S? What is the Bitcoin SV wrong about in terms of CTOR? And if nothing is wrong, why not do it their way? So Bitcoin SV believes that CTOR is wrong and that we shouldn't do it. Um, and they are wrong about that because CTOR is great and awesome and it will help uh, Bitcoin scale. Um, and so like C so Bitcoin SV has this very interesting uh, idea, um, interesting in like not so good of a way. They want to increase the block size limit while simultaneously getting rid of the features that will help us actually achieve the block size limit. Uh, or uh, a higher uh, uh, capacity in a safe fashion. Um, so yeah, I, I do not have any sympathy for that view at all. Um, specifically for CTOR, the things that it uh, makes a big difference in are in block propagation. Um, CTOR allows uh, block propagation to happen by just sending the set of transactions instead of the ordered list of transactions. And it turns out that uh, information theoretically, the order information exceeds the size of the uh, minimum amount of information ne necessary to specify which transactions are in a block. Um, and for graphene, it makes um, around a like sevenfold difference in terms of the encoding size. And graphene isn't necessarily optimal in terms of performance, it's just pretty good. Um, for other uh, algorithms like the x thinner approach that I uh, published a few days ago, um, uh, CTOR reduces the, the information theory uh, entropy by a factor of roughly two, or not the entropy, excuse me, the, the encoding size by a factor of two. Um, so I think that, you know, a factor of two or a factor of seven is worth, uh, worth worrying about. And uh, we're going to have to do it now if we want to do it at all, because it is a large philosophical change, although in terms of code, it's a very small change. So uh, if we want to get it through, we have to do it while Bitcoin Cash is still small. We can't wait until we need to scale before we can add uh, scaling features like this. Thank you, Jonathan. Anyone else like to tackle the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Because um, I, I talked with Armory a bit about this and some other the developers, uh, specifically regarding compact block, because uh, that 
is, is a fairly common transmission method for, for Bitcoin nodes uh, when it comes to transmitting new blocks. And one of the things we discovered is when you start hitting one gigabyte blocks, uh, compact block fails predictably to the point where it's completely unusable. Um, I, I don't have the numbers right offhand, but if I remember correctly, it's around 75% failure rate for one gigabyte blocks. And I think it's like, uh, it's like 100 megabyte blocks is something like 25% failure rate. And so when compact block fails, now you have to transmit the entire contents of the block. Uh, you use up a lot of bandwidth, the transmission time tanks. Uh, it, it really starts generating these perverse incentives uh, for miners to start selfish mining and other, other sorts of behavior. So without CTOR, we start running into this roadblock where one gigabyte is practically unattainable without major changes. Um, so that, that's, that's why me personally, I'm really excited about CTOR. Uh, I haven't really seen any proposals by Enchain to get around this roadblock, uh, I, other, other than their suggestion that hardware ASICs could help improve performance. Uh, but the thing is, is you know, when you're forced to transmit a, a large block over, over a net connection that is potentially weak, especially when you're going cross-continental lines from uh, America to China, for example, or Europe, uh, this problem starts to become very, very real the more data you're trying to transfer. Uh, so uh, unless they have a proposal for how to get around that without CTOR, uh, I think CTOR is the right way forward. Thank you, Jason. Uh, the other thing to note is um, the objections to CTOR haven't particularly been technical. Um, I actually had a conversation uh, with Enchain devs uh, at one point and explained to them how CTOR works and they seemed to agree with it at the time. Um, uh, in fact, they had it listed on their website for a period of time as well. Um, the, there being no technical arguments, um, I, don't, I don't know how we can continue to do protocol development when uh, technical arguments are not the primary factor driving changes. Um, as far as uh, what has been offered, the, the main quote unquote technical argument has been that uh, you can append to Merkle trees in relatively constant time. Um, however, that limits adding transactions to a block to be single threaded. Um, so th that's not really a, a, yeah, I mean, it's technically correct, but it isn't relevant to actually constructing blocks. Like blocks take a long time to, to mine anyways. Like the whole point is to make blocks ex you know, expensive to produce. Um, so that's kind of my two cents on it. Like I would be willing to listen to technical arguments, but I haven't heard any. Thank you, Shaman. Uh, anyone else like to speak to this question? Uh, uh, sorry. Hi, may, uh, hi. may I ask a question about this? Sure, John, Juan, go ahead. Sorry, uh, Juan came yeah. in a bit late and Juan is uh, the CEO of uh, Bitprint. Hi, uh, Jason, can, uh, I wasn't aware that and I, I'm personally, I, I'm, I'm not sure how bigger blocks affects uh, compact blocks uh, efficiency. Uh, just to, to have an idea in which way it affect a bigger block affects the, the heat rate of, of, of CTOR uh, and why if the block increases a lot, uh, it, it starts failing. I, I don't get it. I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. I just don't know in which way it affects so, if you know yeah, it. So I can answer that. Um, Go for so it. what happened and what most uh, method that, you know, really block very quickly rely on is computing some small ID for each transaction and then assuming that the other node that is going to receive the block know about those transactions already. And so you can transmit only a list of small IDs. And the, the, the other node at the other end can reconstruct the block. Like this is how Xin is working, and this is how Compact Block is working as well. The problem is, as the number of transactions in the block start to grow, there are more collisions that happen, meaning there are more transactions that exist on the network at some point in time that have the same short ID. Right? And currently, what happened, because there are many other possible in the block, when every time you have a collision, you cannot reconstruct the block whatsoever. 
And so the bigger the block, the more transaction there is in the block and the more likely there is to be some collision. So at some point, collision just become um, very, very likely and the protocol just don't work anymore. And uh, if, you, if you enforce a specific ordering on the transaction on the block, uh, when you have a small ID at some position, even if you have several transactions that match this small ID, uh, only some of them are gonna fit in the proper range, right? That, at this proper position, right? And the other transaction that may have the same short ID uh, will have to go in some other position in the block. So uh, having a canonical ordering ensure that you can deambiguate uh, those collisions. And so the existing, uh, the existing block propagation technique can work up to significantly larger block size than what they do right now. But also, as Jonathan mentioned, you can develop a whole new series of uh, propagation techniques that are also much more efficient than the one we are right now. Thank you. Right. Anyone else like to speak to this question? No. Uh, oh. we'll... Sorry? Never mind. I had something, but I forgot what it was. Okay. Uh, so moving on to the next question, I'll read it out for you. Um, this question is open to everyone. As developers, how do you envision the current relationship between yourselves and miners evolving in the future? Are you, you are obviously contributing meaningful value to the ecosystem, albeit not contributing hash. How important is something like Mike Hearn's Lighthouse Initiative with respect to making sure your incentives are aligned without destroying the competitive tension that protects the system. Um, so I'm not sure um, I, um, the competitive tension. We we don't have that much competitive tension with miner, right? We are operating on different markets. Uh, more generally, we want to talk with miner as much as possible to you know, um, you know, what are the problems, uh, what what do they want to happen. So it's not always easy because historically there has been a divide between developer and miner, especially uh, you know after the Hong Kong agreement phase and all of that. Like the two community kind of drifted apart, but uh, we're trying to build as many bridges as possible. Okay. Also, maybe Jonathan can talk to this because uh, he's okay, a miner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had started off every other question, so I was trying to uh, not do that this time, but. Um, yeah, so uh, as many of you know, I am an industrial miner, um, and I have been for about four years. Um, I've also been active in the development at uh, various points, but I've been more commonly or more consistently mining than I have been developing. Um, I hope to switch that. I hope to uh, shut down my mining operation over the next uh, two years or so and um, get back to my other projects and whatever. Um, do more development because I think that development is really what's going to determine um, the the success or failure of Bitcoin Cash. I think that it, uh, miners are just producing a commodity. They're just you know doing hashes very very easily, very simply on their uh, machines. But uh, the creativity mostly comes from uh, the development community, um, and I think that miners uh, should support developers uh, financially. I think that um, they should. Uh, set up a certain percentage of their uh, revenue, maybe like one or two percent, which they spread amongst all of the uh, active development communities and uh, give developers uh, mostly free reign to uh, think of whatever they think will help Bitcoin Cash the most. Um, so yeah, I've done that. I uh, contribute to, currently contribute to Bitcoin ABC financially, and I hope to start uh, contributing to Bitcoin Unlimited and possibly XT uh, soon. Um, so I don't think there is any uh, competitive uh, nature between miners and developers. I think that it's a uh, inherently cooperative uh, relationship. Um, Bitcoin Core has not uh, communicated at, or did not communicate as well with miners uh, as they could have. And I think they uh, took on like a dictatorial role. But um, I think that a better role is, is really uh, bilateral cooperation. Um, both both parties give suggestions to the other about what they think is important and um, uh, collaborate on, on creating an, uh, a future of Bitcoin cash that affects the world. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of agree with Jonathan there. Uh, to the question about 
like Lighthouse, um, <clears throat> I mean, that was kind of what Mike Hearn originally created Lighthouse for, was kind of funding development, if I remember. But I don't think we've seen the ability of the community to contribute the type of money that it takes to finance development through like crowdfunding. It's developers aren't particularly cheap. So I, I kind of think at this point, point um, uh, you know, miners are probably the best source of funding for development. It would be nice if we could change it, but we haven't seen that yet. And Jason, you wanted to speak to this? Yeah, I just wanted to expand on it, saying you know, that a fair number of miners uh, contract developers. Uh, so there's a, a pretty strong relationship between uh, them and some of the developers that they've hired. Uh, I'd actually like to see more miners doing this because uh, it gives a better channel for a lot of the, I don't know how you call it, like free range developers, the ones that kind of work more in their own interest and are just getting donations from miners or other indirect methods. I would like to see more of these contract developers coming into the space so that we can communicate with them directly and they would give kind of a better channel for communication with uh, individual mining groups. Um, you know, the big miners, Bitmain, Bitcoin.com, um, we have raw pool and such. Uh, we would like to talk to these developers more directly uh, and it would kind of improve communication across the board. And I think that's how you kind of reduce some of these strange incentives. Um, other than that, I don't really see mechanisms that need to be put in place to kind of enforce good behavior because those already exist in Bitcoin. Okay, anyone else on that question? I'll move on to the next one. If at some point you feel that these questions have been answered satisfactory, satisfactorily, then uh, just let me know and I'll move on to the following question. The next question is, why is CTOR better than any of the other options? There are many uh, of non-enforced options that have been proposed. What are the downfalls of these non-enforced options? I'll take that one. So uh, basically there was um, there's three possible um, kind of paths the client can take. One is the current method, which is the um, topological ordering, um, which we want to remove for scaling purposes. Uh, the other one would be the client can accept any ordering. And then the third one is that there's some canonical order in our case, uh, we have proposed lexicographical ordering. Um, the problem with allowing any order to be accepted is that you have to actually program the client in such a way as to accept all those orders. Um, if you do that, you lose all the benefits in block propagation and, and other things from having a canonical ordering. Uh, you can't, for example, fix the collision problem with uh, compact blocks or X thin uh, when you accept any order because you don't know what order the sender sent you the transactions in. The only way to get around that would be to have some, uh, some kind of flag in the block that says, hey, this is like, a, um, you know, this is a CTOR block produced by ABC. So now we can like add these you know, specialized algorithms to the block propagation and the reconciliation process. Um, but that's very undesirable uh, for a variety of reasons. The clients then also, you know, need to support both of those options, basically. Yeah, you get twice the bug, you get like more, much more complexity in the system in general. And uh, Considering any small change can fork the chain, this is not something where you want the bunch of complexity. Okay. Anybody else like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, so one of the, I think the, the second best option in terms of which C4 we should use is uh, Gavin's order. Uh, so Gavin Anderson in like, I don't know, what was it, 2014, 2013, something like that, uh, made the first proposal for uh, Big O1 or constant time block propagation using uh, IBLTs. And in that proposal, he specified a canonical ordering that uh, would not violate the uh, topological transaction ordering rule that we currently have. So it would be both canonical and uh, consistent with existing rules. And so it could be a soft fork to enable that. And um, I think that that is a decent option, but 
ultimately um, it's slower than uh, the lexicographic um, rule is for generating the sort. And also uh, all the optimizations that you can do with canonical ordering are just a bit harder to do with, uh, with that um, Gavin's order, Gavin's uh, uh, C tour. Um, I did an estimate a while ago, which is on Reddit and I can link it if anybody asks me. Um, but it looks like uh, sorting into uh, Gavin's order would take around 400 nanoseconds per comparison uh, during sorting. Um, so you have log n, that's uh, right, n log n times that uh, for each block. Whereas uh, sorting into lexicographic uh, order takes around five to 20 nanoseconds, something like that. So it could be around uh, uh, 20 times as fast to sort into LTOR than into Gavin's rule. Uh, C tour. Um, I don't know if that's a big enough effect to be a problem, but um, I also don't know why we should spend time looking into a second best option if we know that it's going to be second best. Um, in terms of some other algorithms like XBinner, uh, LTOR is just inherently a lot easier to work with and easier to program for and easier to develop optimizations for. So, uh, and also for like uh, UTXO inserts, um, uh, the LTOR rule makes all of our inserts sequential which could be a big advantage in terms of performance for the UTXO bottleneck uh, at some point in the future. So um, yeah, there are some other options out there that are decent, but uh, I think that they're not quite as good or they're, uh, for some of the other options, they're just way worse because you, know, you, can't, you can't have one code path for everything. You have to have three or four or maybe just two uh, code paths and having more code paths means that neither code path gets optimized and yeah, but Bugs suck. We don't like those. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, anyone else like to address the question? Yeah, I might. Maybe I'll give a comment too. Like it just John John is talking about it just makes me think. Like it, it's sort of if you look at all the different options. Like he's talking about Gavin's order, which preserves the topological, but then you also have a canonical rule on top of that. The question was more about. I guess the question said, well, why don't we just remove topological and allow any order? So that's kind of the opposite you're doing. So, so when you start picking and choosing these different options, um, like if you're going to remove the topological order, there's basically no reason not like you get like that, that allows you the benefits of parallelization stuff. Um, but then there's no reason not to have lexicographic canonical order with that. Like the other options don't really fit well together. Like, so I guess I see you just having pure lexicographic order. Um, you get basically the best of all worlds. You get the parallelization benefits and the transmission benefits and the simplicity of the data structure. So, um, yeah, like, I guess I guess my point is like there's a lot of these arguments where someone, if you look focused only on one aspect, you say, well, this other thing will also help with that aspect. But then when you consider everything together, um, the, the lexicographic canonical order. Just, just is basically best on every metric. So yeah, that's just my overall kind of take on it. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, anyone else want to speak to this? I'll move on to the next question then. Uh, will any of the bot sorry, will any of the bottlenecks problems discovered during the stress test be fixed with the November changes? Of those, are any of them protocol changes? Uh, actually, most of them are not uh, consensus-related changes. And there have been already a few fixes for some of them uh, that have been made. Uh, the reason why we are focusing on consensus changing for consensus changes for November is that uh, well, first <laughs> November is uh, the uh, you know the time to upgrade the consensus rules, right? So we want to upgrade consensus rules at that time, but also uh, as the ecosystem grows, it becomes more expensive uh, to change the consensus rules, right? Because more people have to upgrade. So the reason at which we upgrade right now is not something that we can sustain long term. And so we want to fix the consensus rule right now that prevent from scaling really, really big as soon as possible, right? So. Um, as a result, we're going to uh, focus on some of those changes in November, like like CTOR is one of them. We already talked about it a lot. But 
Other limit that we notice during the stress test, such as um, uh, how many uh, transactions are forwarded on the network, so there is a rate limitation of how many um, transactions are propagated on the network, for instance. This one has been fixed already uh, by Jonathan. Inventory, yeah, inventory broadcast max, uh, which uh, Noel C. Greg Maxwell pointed out. Yeah. And, and other ones are being worked on, but those other changes they don't really require a fork. So uh, as soon as they're ready, we're gonna have a release. Uh, you know, as soon as one of the changes is ready, we're gonna have a release with that change. Thank you, Amri. Anyone else like to address this question? Um, I'll just uh, throw in a few things. Yeah, so the inventory broadcast max thing um, was limiting uh, Bitcoin ABC and SV um, to about three megabytes of transactions being uploaded every 10 minutes. Uh, so the only large blocks that we got, uh, the you know, 21.3 megabyte blocks, those happened after very long intervals. Uh, the 21 megabyte block happened after uh, a longer than one hour interval. Just because you know, uh, blocks are uh, stochastic, they have random intervals, um, and this just happened to be a long block, and because it was a long uh, interval block, it was big. Um, so we, I fixed the, uh, or I was one who submitted the very, very simple, ridiculously simple patch to fix the uh, inventory broadcast max bug. Um, and uh, that actually is already live on the network. Uh, when the uh, bug fix, the, the security fix for the inflation and uh, crash bug that we had uh, was pushed out, uh, inventory broadcast max per megabyte, the you know, uh, modified version was already in that code. So, uh, yeah, it, this doesn't have to wait for November for these fixes. You just need to um, uh, make sure that we're always ahead of demand. And right now, we are well ahead of demand, so we're focusing on the, the things that need to be done with a very long uh, runway, very long lead time, like Q4. Uh, but we're also working on things like parallelizing uh, the accepts memory pool code and getting better benchmarks in and uh, uh, planning on how to deal with the UTXO access bottleneck. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Anyone else want to address it? Uh, I wish to add just a small thing that, at least for us, uh, in order to have a strategy to, to scale and parallelize, we need to know what tools do we have. So uh, what, we can start moving in the direction when CTOR is activated, and there's, no, there's nothing we can do uh, in terms of which techniques we are going to use for a ma massive scaling in order to parallelize the block validation in order to have a, a pal block validation time that is economically useful for, for miners. Uh, we need to know what do we have. Uh, with the current ordering, there are some restrictions that with CTOR, we see a lot of potential. Even if at the beginning there's no tangible improvement is a starting point where we can improve a lot. And as soon as we have it activated, every implementation will start finding the best ways to take advantage of that. So unless we need the, the, the feature first, and then we can start making progresses on top of, on top of that. Thank you, Juan. Um, I'll move on to the next question now. The next question comes across, um, I don't know if this is from Andrew Stone, but they are technical arguments against CTOR, uh, and then in brackets from Andrew Stone, so I don't know if this is directly from him. But I'm going to present them one at a time forward here. Uh, so graphene can accept multiple types of ordering. Not forcing a certain ordering now keeps the possibility of continuing to exploring ordering that would help scaling, and graphene can just be updated to use that when the time comes. Uh, anybody want to address that? Yeah, so this one has already been addressed. Uh, uh, if you want to do that, you essentially need to have two code paths, right? You have one code path that like, if it's uh, canonically ordered, then do the optimized stuff for canonical ordering. And if not, then you do the other stuff. So you end up having twice as much code and twice as much bugs. Uh, one of those cut paths is likely to be exercised very little, which means there is a high likelihood that there is bugs that lurk in there for a very long time. It's, um, generally, it's, it's not, um, 
Like it, it's not the path you want to go in. Okay. Adding a bunch of complexity in there is not the path you want to go in. Okay. Thank you, Amri. Uh, Shay. Yeah. The other, you know, the other part of that uh, question sort of assumes that there's uh, maybe some other ordering that exists that could be more beneficial than using a lexicographical ordering. Um, I don't really think that that bears out. Um, it, it, what ordering you use isn't so important as that you use a canonical ordering um, a, or you know, a total ordering for the block. Um, and so any of those total orderings for a block would be pretty much equally as good um, unless there's some extra overhead calculation. Like for example, with Gavin's canonical ordering, you need to still calculate the descendants in order to do the sort. Um, so yeah, in short, I don't, I don't think anyone will ever find a, a better ordering. I, I, there's probably a, a way to prove that mathematically. Um, I don't know if any other panelists wants to, to comment on that, but I, uh, I don't, I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any, any of, like essentially any ordering that is cheap to compute fits the bill. Like right now we make them in, in by transaction ID in ascending manner, but we could make them by transaction ID in descending manner. That would be just the opposite order and that would provide the exact same benefit. As long as you have some order that you can compute locally, meaning from the transaction and this immediate neighbor, you can compute if the order is correct or not. As long as you can do that, you get all the benefits, whatever the rule is. Yeah. But then it's and just you can one rules and no matter what that rule is going to be, it's, it's going to be just as good. Using transaction ID for your sorting is a lot faster than using anything that requires deep inspection of the transaction because it reduces yeah. uh, in particular the, the number of uh, uh, pointer lookups or pointer dereferences that you have to do. And pointer dereferences, um, they're fairly slow because you have to go to main memory. You just don't know what part of main memory you're going to go to. And uh, with most of the um, most of the alternative proposals, you have to do more than one pointer dereference um, in order to do each comparison. So that's the main reason that uh, the other options are likely to not be uh, faster or better. Um, with LTOR, uh, with the uh, using TXIDs, you just you're able to use an array of um, of just TXIDs, just 32 bytes per transaction. It's very dense. It's very uh, regular. It's all in a vector or a, an array. Um, so memory access is get pipelines, um, and it's just extremely efficient. Um, so, uh, but yeah, like uh, there are also some, so the, the question I think also touched on whether it has to be mandatory. Um, uh, it would be better, Andrew Stone says, or a few people say, if we could just get the benefit without making it mandatory, uh, because that way we don't get locked into um, this one system. And that's, a little bit of a red herring because we're not getting locked into this one system. Um, the, uh, the code does not have to be changed uh, to be able to verify each block type. Um, if we want to change this uh, rule later to be, uh, let's just say, uh, sorting in uh, descending order, we would just flip the order, um, then we can just say that after this certain block, uh, we also check that it's in this particular order and before this certain block, uh, we uh, don't check the order at all. Um, that is perfectly valid for uh, uh, creating the UTXO database, which is all you really need to do from these blocks. You don't need to verify things that came before a checkpoint that gets uh, hard-coded unless you, you know, want to be really paranoid about somebody creating an alternate history in which they have exactly the same amount of proof of work or more, but which forks off in like, you know, uh, five years in the past and invalidates one particular block way back then. It's just, it's like an absurd scenario. So um, yeah, I think that uh, we're not getting uh, locked into this, but there's not going to be anything that's better. So um, why not just focus on doing one thing really well and then we can move on to the next thing. We can focus on doing something else really well. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, one, one quick thing. Um, this kind of techniques is used by Ethereum, is used by Ripple, is used by uh, like almost all the coins that are not directly derived from Bitcoin. It's like, it's pretty much a de facto standard in the, in the industry by now. It's like extremely well researched and, and extremely well understood. Okay, thank you, Omri. Um, we have a couple of other points. I'm not sure they're actual questions that were brought forward 
uh, from Andrew Stone. So I'm just going to go through them quickly. Uh, just two more points. The sharding proposed by ABC doesn't work for light wallets, SPV and mobile wallets, which really defeats the whole purpose of Bitcoin Cash when the focus is on the majority of users using light wallets. Hence, a completely different sharding approach would need to be taken to solve this requirement. If there's any comments on that? No, that yeah, that's not a question. Um, it's more of an assertion and it's totally false. Um, the sharding proposal that uh, I described in the article I wrote is actually a trusted sharding proposal. So basically um, allows miners and exchanges and anyone else who wants to run a node to horizontally scale the uh, creation and validation of blocks and mempool acceptance. Um, it has nothing to do with the light wallet protocol um, whatsoever. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, that argument is very similar to say like you cannot, you know, you cannot run train on that road. Well, it's a road. So <laughs> um, this all stuff is there to shard block generation, propagation, validation, right? Um, you, if you want to support SPV wallet, you need to have another infrastructure that's going to do index per addresses, essentially, right? So um, what, what a server for SPV wallet needs to do is that you have your SPV wallet, you have a set of addresses in there that are your addresses for your coins. You're going to send that to the server in some manner, and the server is going to be able to retrieve the UTXO that corresponds to those addresses and send them to you. This is a very classic key value pair. It scales very well. Um, there is like, uh, essentially like in the, in the computer science uh, domain, it's, it's a solved problem. Like we know how to store, we know how to scale key value store to very, very big sizes. Um, the whole stuff about CTOR and about scaling block, like so scaling block validation doesn't scale uh, address, you know, address lookup. Like that's, that's kind of obvious. Um, uh, it's just two different things. So the, the whole thing is like a complete red herring, it, it, like it doesn't compute. All right. I can, I can add, I, I have a thought on that also. <laughs> like, I guess the way I see it is like a node has to see every transaction. So you need to be able to scale and parallelize everything. For SPV wallets, like say there's some limit, like a, well, like a node can only support 10,000 SPV wallets and you run into some limit where you can't scale beyond that. But you can add more nodes that support other wallets. So that's not really, like the amount of SPV wallets per node isn't really a thing that will limit the growth of Bitcoin Cash um, because you can just add more nodes to support more wallets. Um, so I don't think... Like, I don't think optimizing the number of SPV wallets per node um, is a real limit. We can, also, we can also optimize the number of SPV wallets per node a lot past 10,000. Um, SPV yeah, well, Merkle block requests work as a Bloom filter, and you can just add more requests into a single Bloom filter and check the entire block simultaneously for 100,000 um, uh, wallets in a single pass if you want to. So. Yeah. I just, I just um, chose a random number off the top of my head, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, <laughs> there is no random, there is no, yeah, so um, I, I think that, uh, I'm taking the floor, uh, so I think that maybe Andrew Stone's objection was that you don't know whom to send your SPV Merkle block requests to um, if it's charted, but I think that that misunderstands the nature of the charting protocol, or the, the, the proposal. Um, so in the charting proposal, you still have one node that, deals with the entire block and that deals with the entire uh, UTXO set. It's just that one node is now comprised of 10 different computers. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the sharding happens behind the network layer as a backend thing. And the interface is uh, still going to be, or will likely still be the same. Yeah, it needs to be pointed out that load balancing is a very well solved problem. Like every single company that you know the name of does this, uh, especially you know Google, yeah. Facebook, Amazon, etc. Uh, load balancing, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't even consider to be a, a difficult problem to solve at this point. All right, then with that, uh, we just had one more statement or argument that came forward from Andrew Stone. I'm just going to read it out to you. Uh, ABC proposal ignores validation of transaction input. Andrew Stone concludes, 
If this sharding scheme can handle the validation routing load, it can handle the top level routing of unsorted transactions. CTOR is therefore not necessary. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, that's not true. The proposal actually explicitly calls out uh, validating transaction inputs and how it could be done. Um, the second part of this, if, if the sharding scheme can handle the validation and routing load, it can handle the top level. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> the question disappeared that I was reading. Uh, it can handle the top level routing of unsorted transactions. Um, when you shard the transactions across a lot of nodes and you need to do uh, a validation of the transaction input, uh, let's say transaction, uh, the transaction that you're trying to validate uh, is chained with another transaction uh, that is in the block. So you have that transaction on shard A and the input is over on shard B or C. In order to do that validation, you have to be able to know that shard A, the, the node handling shard A, needs to be able to tell which shard the input would be in. Uh, when you have uh, an, basically an unordered uh, set of transactions, you need some other kind of index to be able to look up what, trend, uh, what shard the input would be in. And maintaining that index is actually quite expensive. Um, so CTOR actually makes this process faster by allowing a simple computation basically, is the input transaction ID within this range, then go to this other shard and look for the input. Um, so it actually improves that, uh, that, um, uh, that portion of validation quite a bit over an any order proposal. Um, the assertion that it can handle top level routing, like, yeah, you might be able to scale that. Uh, the, the original CTOR paper uh, talks about how that's the scaling properties of that. Um, it's actually significantly worse um, and it may actually top out before you uh, can get to very large blocks. <clears throat> but more to the point, if we want to get to planetary scale for this where 7 billion people are using this, there's no room for waste in the protocol, especially when it's not necessary. Like, why would we go with another ordering proposal when we already know that it's slower? That's just okay. gonna reduce the total number of users that can, can, can use Bitcoin Cash. Thank you, Shama. Um, I, uh, Jonathan, did you wanna add one more thing? Yeah, well, so my opinion on this is, this particular issue is actually uh, a lot closer to Enderstone's than to Shama's. Um, uh, I think there, there are some advantages for sharding uh, for uh, LTOR, but they're not that big. Uh, my guess is that they're around 20 or 30 percent, something somewhere in that range. Um, and you know, is that worth making a big fuss about? Not really. Um, but uh, the sharding benefit is, has always been a side benefit of LTOR. The main benefits are in block propagation, and that's always been uh, the big bottleneck at uh, Salesforce. Um, block validation is already about 20 times as fast as, uh, uh, as block propagation is. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, elsewhere is definitely not worse for sharding. Um, it's probably a decent chunk faster, probably not uh, worth making a big deal about. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Can I, can I add something real quick, too? Sure, Anthony and then uh, Shay and then we'll move on. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to point out, this is kind of what I was mentioning before, is that if you look at this objection and then the previous objection about graphene, that you could use some other canonical order, um, there, those two objections are contradict each other. So this, this, this objection is saying, we, you could use in any order and not have canonical order and it would be just as good. Whereas the previous objection said it could have some other canonical order that preserves the topological. So those two things are mutually and like mutually incompatible. So, um, you know, if, if you you can kind of go one way or the other, but with with Altor, you get you get the best of both worlds. So that's what, Thank that's you, Anthony. Say one more thing. The the other thing is um, with respect to any order and the validation of transaction inputs that does not. It doesn't scale linearly. It actually scales uh, super linearly or more than linear, which means adding more machines doesn't necessarily get you the same performance benefit as, uh, as it normally would under LTOR. So while it may be 20 or 30% right now, I, that's it. what will it be when you have blocks that are a terabyte big? Thanks, Yushay. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next question. 
Um, this does not have anything to do with Andrew Stone. Um, the question is, is the 100 byte limit a possible danger? Miners losing blocks due to short coin bases. Um, who would like to take this question? Um, so that's possible. I mean, like a miner can always lose a block by not respecting any of the consensus rules. So there is nothing specific about that rules, you know, that that would, you know, make it the case. Uh, what we see in practice is that the coin base are bigger than this uh, because minor, uh, so you, the coin base is like a special transaction uh, that have a special input that comes from nowhere, right? Like it's, it's been coins that doesn't exist. It's all the miner create new coins when it finds a block. And this input that comes from nowhere has also a signature script out of it, where the miner can put a ton of data. And, and if you go on Block Explorer or buy your stuff, you see messages that are in the block. Uh, they are in the signature of the coin base. And typically, uh, because miner puts some message in there, uh, the coin base is actually bigger than uh, 100 byte. And miners can just have that space. Like if they know that there's a rule saying that you have to have a 100 byte or greater uh, coin base transaction, then they can just stick up to 100 bytes into that script stick. That's the size of it. So it's, it's really trivial to, uh, to make sure that the miner will not have that problem. And if uh, they do violate that problem, that's their own damn fault. Thank you, Jonathan. Any other comments on this question? Hearing none, I'll move on to the next question. Could you describe the security testing that has been done for the November ABC changes? Uh, yeah, so I can talk to that. First, um, any change that we make, especially to the consensus rules, come with unit tests and integration tests that we run on every single modification on the code. So all the, all the consensus changes are essentially like every time we change anything on the code, we verify that those consensus rules are still applied and respected properly by the code base. Uh, so in addition to that, there is a test net that has been running uh, for like a month now where the, the new rules are activated. So if you want to play with them, uh, poke with them, poke around, see if that works, um, you can do so. You can find the parameter of the test net uh, on like various places, but most importantly on the front page of BitcoinCash.org. Um, and, and maybe Guillermo can talk a bit more about the test net because he's been more involved with that. Yes. Uh, for every hard fork, not only this, uh, we set the test net, we test the activation point, and set up some miners to check if they get blocked in place and RPC calls are working fine. So yes, like Amaury said, this was done like a month ago and the testnet is currently being mined by us and anyone can join. And yes, we make sure that the testnet is forked from the original testnet, the original Bitcoin Cash testnet. And well, everything is working fine. We found a couple of minor bugs that were fixed in the in the next version, I believe, 18.1. So from that point on, everything is working fine. Hey, Guillermo, has the, um, <clears throat> is there check data sig transactions on that test net? Uh, do you know if anyone made them? I know that in the testing channel of the ABC Slack, uh, some people were talking about that. Uh, me personally, I didn't send a, a check that's a stick transaction. Um, Mark Lindeberg has. So yes, there are some up, uh, CSV transactions on testnet. Okay, cool. Right. Thank you. Any other comments about this question? Jason. Um, so I want to add a little bit, because Omri had mentioned about test coverage. Um, we, we've noticed a number of parts in the code that were like not well covered. Um, I actually personally spent over a month just writing tests to cover critical parts of the code. Um, this is something we're always looking into, but and it wasn't necessarily related to the November changes specifically, 
But when we identify these portions of the code that are not well covered um, or not well understood, like we immediately go to write tests. And that's not just part of the review process for when we make changes, but it's also just part of our regular review. Thank you, Jason. Any further comments? Moving on to the next question then. Uh, the question is, how come Graphene is not yet working in Bitcoin ABC while it's already working in BU? Well, saying uh, that it's working in BU. Just a sec, one at a time. Uh, Armin, do you want to take this first then? No, no, uh, Jonathan can go ahead. He, okay. has, he has more detailed knowledge. Okay, yeah. So saying that it's working in Bitcoin Unlimited is a bit of an exaggeration. There is an alpha version um, that is a complete, uh, uh, feature complete version. It can transmit blocks, um, but the current code has a failure rate of around, uh, in, in one user's tests, 41%, sorry, a success rate of 41%, uh, failure rate of 59% on a, a two day interval using regular size 100 kilobyte ish uh, Bitcoin cash blocks. Um, so graphing still needs a lot of optimization. Um, the current graphing code also has the reordering and uh, the transaction reordering based on um, you know, what the actual block order is uh, instead of using some canonical rule. And that adds a factor of roughly seven to the graphing encoding size. And it also adds a lot of code that will be completely unnecessary uh, after the November hard fork. Um, so yeah, as far as I understand it, the Bitcoin ABC um, approach to this has been, let's do CTOR first because it'll make the code simpler. Uh, that way we don't have to write code that is only active for half a month or a month or something like that. Um, and that seems reasonable. Um, also, we want to see the, the protocol, uh, or at least the, some of the research on it, uh, get a little bit better developed so, we, so that we know how to, to tune the parameters in order to not get a 41% success rate. Because 41% success rate doesn't really help that much. It actually might even hurt overall. So trying one algorithm yeah. first and then it fails and you have to fall back to the other algorithm. Uh, so there's additional latency there. So yeah, I mean, we definitely uh, want to see graphene implemented in all options. It is uh, by far the most efficient proposal when it works. Um, but uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. It still needs a lot of work. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Jason, or sorry, Shama first. Uh, yeah, also, I mean, part of this question uh, just has to do with the development philosophies between BU and ABC. Um, uh, from our perspective, we want to be very conservative, uh, try and implement as few uh, code changes as possible, um, make sure that everything is basically fully specified before we implement it. Um, right now, the graphing spec, um, unless something's happened since I last looked at it, actually is not completed. Um, there's still commentary going on it. Um, now, uh, BU and Andrew Stone uh, have a much more liberal philosophy of like, go ahead and get, get things out there and uh, kind of experiment with them, um, which, which is good, but also has its own drawbacks. Jason? Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. Um, I actually really like that BU is experimenting with this. Uh, we've been reviewing the graphing spec from time to time and helping them uh, with improvements. But uh, until the spec is finalized, I don't think ABC will be building it. Hold on, hold on, so. it does sound like you're building in the background, though, Jason. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, not a bit. There are a, a, few, a few aspects of the specs that would I think require improvement. Uh, one, Jonathan hinted it is like um, you need to pick various number when you transmit a block with graphene. Um, picking those number right now doesn't seem to be working very well because the failure rate is pretty high. So there is that. There is a lot of complexity that is added because uh, there is no canonical ordering right now. So you can simplify graphene a lot uh, by removing you know, like by removing the current ordering rules and moving to canonical ordering. Um, there is also uh, various stuff. So for instance, um, there is no what is called high bandwidth mode. So what you want when you transmit the block, you want uh, the transmission to happen as fast as possible, right? Um, so you want the amount of data to transmit to be small, but you also want to limit the amount of round trips that you do. 
and if you waste a bit of data, you send a bit more data than you would otherwise, but we in a round trip in the process, then you're probably getting ahead. Um, this is what uh, compact block does, for instance, uh, when you use compact block, your node is gonna select some peers to put them in high bandwidth mode where they send you the block directly without a round trip. Right now there is no way to do graphene without a round trip. And considering how small graphing blocks are, the round trip is actually probably the slower part of it. Um, there is no randomization on the short IDs, which means that if you get a collision for some reason, the block is impossible to send through graphing because the same collision is going to happen in every graphing block that you can build. So you need randomization of short ID. And, and there, there are um, um, a few other, um, there are a few other uh, points like that that need to be improved in the, in the current spec. So it's not quite, um, it's not quite where it should be. Uh, though it's great that it's live somehow and, and, and we can get data from it. So this part is, is absolutely great. But I think it's gonna need to go through a few iteration before we can consider that graphene is production ready. Thank you, Amri. Any further comment on that question? Hearing none, I'll move on to um, the next question, which is what is ABC's proposal to improve the mempool, mempool acceptance code? Um, I'm working on that. It's in progress. Uh, so far, I have code that uh, improves performance on a four-core machine by almost three times. Um, it's uh, the the change that I'm making is pretty conservative or relatively narrow. Um, it's a lot less uh, sleeping and general than the changes that Andrew Stone made in uh, his uh, Bitcoin Unlimited Gigaperf uh, branch but uh, it seems to be getting most of the benefit. Um, currently, uh, I can run a full node uh, on mainnet with this code for about six hours before it crashes. So I still have some work to do before I uh, submit the code. Uh, but I think once I find the last few um, bugs that I know about in it, I'll be willing to uh, submit a version uh, to ABC uh, with a few other bugs inserted and make sure that they can catch those bugs before uh, uh, before we uh, commit it. Is there yeah, a bounty? Are you setting up a bounty for that as well, Jonathan? I could do that too, yeah. I'm, I, uh, no, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm joking. Pardon me. I, I, no, this I, is an idea that I've wanted to do for a while. I mean, like, I am a miner. I, I do have uh, the resources to be able to set up bounties out for uh, the things that I contribute. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Um, it won't be huge, but um, okay. I'm not going to have something like that. I apologize. That was my attempt at humor. Um, oh, did, funny. Does anybody else want to speak to uh, ABC's proposal to improve the mempool acceptance code? Uh, yeah, so what Jonathan is doing is like the, the short to medium term plan. The longer term plan is really to rewrite a bunch of that code because uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very crafty, but it's also, you know, very, very tedious code to rewrite. Um, it's both performance critical and consensus critical. So we are going to do it, but very slowly on that front. So don't expect something shortly on that front. Or, however, I expect the work of Jonathan, uh, hopefully to be released in the end, uh, you know, next few months. Excellent. Probably right. less. I don't know. It's up to, <laughs> up to no, Jonathan. No, I think a few months uh, makes sense. This, I think, needs a good review. So. Uh, it's not going to be rushed. I've got another question regarding CTOR. Um, I'm going to get it out there. Um, in the in in no, let's see if I can read this properly. In the field observation by Tom Zander shows current CTOR implementation suffers from a reduction in validation speed. Your thoughts on this? No, that is not in the field observation. That is uh, Tom Zander noticing that. He doesn't know how to code uh, CTOR, the, the outputs and inputs algorithm, into his particular um, uh, Bitcoin implementation called Flowey, which nobody currently uses. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean that it's not possible. That just means that he hasn't either tried hard enough or he doesn't know how to do it. Um, I have looked at it, and I think that I know how to implement uh, OTI in his 
um, in his code, and I think that it will just have the same one extra loop overhead that it has for ABC. And I did do in the field uh, performance testing uh, on ABC's code base with uh, the OTI algorithm versus the traditional algorithm. And I noticed that, it, yes, it is actually uh, slower to do OTI validation, which can work with any uh, ordering, than it is to use the uh, current rule. It's slower by 0.5%. And that's uh, a, pretty much what we'd expect, given that um, the overhead for iterating through uh, a vector is about 0.8 nanoseconds um, compared to uh, around 200 nanoseconds for the, um, the uh, pointer dereferences you need in order to do the lookups and, and so forth, or 300 nanoseconds for the, um, the hash table lookup. So uh, I, I mean, I don't think he's talking about 0.5%. I think that he's talking about uh, the difference between the parallel validation that he already has, which looks at multiple blocks in parallel versus uh, the fact that, that is not present in ABC's code base because we're trying to do something uh, a little bit more rigorous and uh, 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 reliable. Um, and I think that's a red herring. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I, I would like to add on this. Uh, first, uh, I, I noticed the same number as Jonathan, so that it's, it's lower, but by like a negligible amount. Um, that being said, it's actually fairly common when you start implementing algorithms that parallelize that in single threaded performance or in small amount of data, they actually run slower. And usually the performance hit that you notice is significantly worse than what we see uh, with uh, OTI. Um, having performance hit of more than 10% or, or 20% is actually not that uncommon uh, when you move from a single threaded implementation to a parallel implementation. Uh, here is the deal though, if you want to scale, you need the parallel implementation. Because um, one single core on one single machine can only get that fast. Um, essentially, like single core performance over the past 10 years on CPUs has become slower, not faster. And the reason is that CPU manufacturers optimize uh, a single core to be more energy efficient so that they can put more core on the same chip and still dissipate the, the like, you know, the, the temperature. And, 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 and this is the way, you know, this is the direction that, uh, that CPU, like CPU manufacturers are going into for like the last decades. Uh, they put more core in their chip and this is how they make that chip more powerful. And exploiting those core, like when you move from a single traded algorithm to an algorithm that can exploit all those core, Initially, you take a hit in performance, and the fact that we take only 0.5% is actually kind of miraculous. Um, but then the advantage is, is that you want to make it faster, you have more data to process. Well, you buy a CPU with more core, and eventually there is, uh, we have so much data that there is no CPU with more core, so you buy two servers, and, and then three servers, and so on, right? So once you move to that type of algorithm, you've changed scaling from a technical problem how fast can I make this one core go to an economical problem? Like how many machines I'm willing to buy um, to process this amount of data? And, and this is where we want to be, right? If we want to scale big, we know that one core is not enough. And so uh, we need something that, you know, scale horizontally. Thank you, Amri. Um, nothing further, I'll go on to the next question. I am curious as to the six month upgrade process. What process is taken to decide what changes are added to an upgrade? This leads to a potential concern that certain changes might be forced in a package upgrade with rider proposals that must be accepted to adopt the more important changes. Yes, yeah, so I can talk to that. We actually have uh, meetings with also implementation every two weeks on which those kinds of matter are decided. However, what seems to be happening in practice is that people decide something in the meeting and then they go on to do something completely different. Um, so th this is a bit of a problem we are discussing internally in ABC right now to you know, see how we want to change things because the, the current way of doing things is not tenable. Um, but yeah. 
<laughs> Jason? Yeah. Um, so also to add, um, one of the things is since Bitcoin Cash is still relatively young, like we are seeing kind of like these, you know, pat batches of uh, changes going in. We don't actually expect to see that as much in the future. Uh, ideally, whenever we have a scheduled hard fork, there'd be one, maybe two major changes to, to consensus rules, let's say. Um, but we don't expect to see these large packages of changes going in. Uh, that's not ideal. Uh, we would like people to all agree and then go, hey, we're going to upgrade for this one specific thing. And then everything else that's not consensus related can go into other releases. And um, that, that's how I hope to see things going forward. But, you know, since we are working towards the November fork with a lot of these changes, inevitably they were batched. Yeah. And everything in the November fork was uncontroversial until like one or two months ago. Um, so it caught us. Uh, all that surprise when it start, started coming out of the woodwork and saying, hey, wait a minute, this isn't, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. Uh, we need to you know, split this uh, out and separate these. And you know, if, if people had raised those concerns easier earlier, it would have been a lot easier to uh, come up with a non-packaged fork. But the code was already almost done or basically done uh, by the time those concerns were raised. So that, that made it a lot uh, more difficult. Um, yeah, I, I really like the idea of using BIP9 and BIP135 for voting for uh, Bitcoin like BTC. Um, but unfortunately, uh, because Bitcoin Cash is a minority fork, it's really hard to use minor, minor voting as a proxy for user support because somebody who just believes really strongly in the issue can take all of their hash rate off of BTC and direct it to BCH just to rock that vote. Like, uh, Via BTC, for example, has last I looked eight percent of the Bitcoin Cash hash rate, but they have uh, about six petahash or sorry six exahashes of total hash rate compared to three point five exahashes of total BCH hash rate. So they could uh, take half of their BTC hash rate and mine one hundred percent of the blocks on Bitcoin Cash if they wanted to. So yeah, we we can't trust those kinds of minor signals as long as we're a minority for. Um, so. If somebody has a good, robust proposal for how to do uh, piecewise approval voting um, of uh, uh, forks, we're, we're, I think, all interested in hearing it. But uh, we can't do minor voting, unfortunately. Uh, next in order would be Shama and then Omri. Uh, yeah, the other thing that I, I kind of wanted to point out with this is that um, this question sort of assumes that uh, that six months hard forks will continue forever and that uh, there will always be a necessary, uh, you know, need for adding or upgrading the, the protocol. Um, while we can't possibly foresee all the, you know, the possible use cases in the future and say that, you know, nothing will ever change. Um, like Omri said before, is that changes get progressively more, you know, expensive as use increases. Um, and, at least from ABC's perspective, um, so far as I've talked to other developers on the team, uh, there isn't an endless need for changes. What we would like to do is get to the point where the protocol can be scaled horizontally across machines. And then at that point, there's not a lot of uh, impetus for changing the protocol after that, because now you have this economic um, way of scaling where you just buy more, more machines. Uh, rather than continually needing to adjust the protocol, um, even for opcodes, it's it's hard to say. Once you have a full uh, suite of basic operations, including op mall, op invert, all these other items, uh, you have a total uh, Turing language, and you can compute any values using those. Um, there may be some use for specialized opcodes like uh, 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 data sync verify. Um, but those would have to be argued, you know, with a strong case in the future. Thank you, Shama. And Omri, did you want to make a comment? Uh, yeah, so Jonathan pointed on it, so we'd like to uh, go back to the timeline a bit. Uh, the change that are going out in the, this current upgrade has been put on the table a long time ago. Actually, you can go on the website. Um, you can go on the ABC website. You can go on Enchain website. Um, also, Bitpre made an announcement about it. Uh, various, uh, various people working on the protocol made announcements about those changes up to last November, actually, and last December. 
and and you can find those documents on the website those those, those various um, people working on the protocol and so the work on those has been going on for what for like a year uh, it's it's been decided since pretty much the beginning of bitcoin cash that the, the freeze for code and feature is three months before the fork uh, because uh, the ecosystem needs to be able to you know test the change and upgrade we need to have enough time to figure out if there is a bug in there and be able to react uh, in a way that is not last minute scramble so um, so that puts the, the deadline on August 15, right? So up to August 15, everybody has the same roadmap and everybody is working toward that. Uh, what happened is that SV, Bitcoin SV has been announced on August 16, right? So after, after the freeze date, uh, no concern were particularly raised before that, uh, which uh, essentially... Um, puts it in an impossible situation to be compatible with anyone. Uh, today, there is still no release of the software. There is no public testnet. There is no mining pool. Like all those stuff is like coming soon. And so um, what I notice here is that uh, uh, Bitcoin SV has been very good at generating a lot of noise and a lot of confusion, which is extremely bad for Bitcoin Cash. But um, like they have not delivered anything except confusion especially so far. Yeah, their timing seems like it was almost intended to yeah. cause a change split. It seems like, yeah, it's, it's, it's very confusing. So yeah, what after, after that is that people start being doubtful and, and be like, okay, maybe we need to implement post proposal, for instance, this is what BU proposed to do. They're gonna implement post change sets. Um, but, but all this confusion come after August uh, 16, where SV announced their client. Um, and, and now this is up to the community to decide if we want to um, essentially allow someone to throw a wrench into the whole process and derail everything or, or not. Um, but but I, I think this is extremely damageable for Bitcoin Cash because the market, like, this is money, and the last thing you want your money to be is completely unpredictable, right? So it's very important to have roadmap way ahead of time and, and very clear timeline and stick to those. Uh, so right now would be the good time to discuss what's gonna happen in May next year. Uh, so that by the time we get anywhere close to May, it's very clear to everybody what's happening. Uh, yeah, yeah. If I if I had to give an advice to people, and actually we want feedback from people, like what do we need to do in May? Uh, so far, we think it's good to include uh, the the set of opcode that SV is proposing because we have time to review. Coming to May it was uh, way too short of a notice. Oh, uh, it was done for November, but we can probably do them in May. But besides that, uh, I'd be very curious to know what people want to do. Thank you, Amri. I uh, just want to remind people that we are reaching an hour and a half into this uh, uh, event today, and I'm conscious of uh, people's uh, needs to take breaks and so on. So I'm going to try and wrap things up within the next half hour, uh, just to be fair to everyone that's participating. I do want to let you know that um, that's usually the timeline that we give when we're organizing and uh, coaching the development groups through the, um, uh, the Bitcoin Cash development meetings that happen bi-weekly. So I just want to, you know, we just have sort of a, a patience level and obviously people have biological needs as well. Um, so having said that, we'll go for at least another half hour and then I'll check in with the panel and see if they're okay with continuing. The next question that has come up um, is, what future steps are going to be taken to assure there will always be efficient compatibility between the different BCH node software? If ABC's implementation of Graphene would not work with BU implementation and XT implementation, the optimizations are not going to be as effective as they can be. For instance, on Ethereum, Geth and Parity both have a light mode uh, setting that does not require the entire chain, but Geth nodes with light mode on don't 
on don't have or don't serve parity nodes with light mode on and the other way around last time I checked. Um, I apologize if I pronounce things related to Ethereum incorrectly. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not aware of too much to do with Ethereum. So, right, if, so far. if somebody wants to answer that question, please feel free. Yeah, so we've hinted about that a bit. Uh, we've run rounds of review on the Graphene spec um, that, that is being working on for BU. So it's, it's not, uh, at least last, last time I reviewed it, it was not a complete spec, but I still, um, I still provided various comments and various review. Uh, if the spec get to a point where uh, it, it reach a good level of quality, then then ABC is going to do its best to, to uh, you know make something that is compatible with it. Uh, absolutely, this is why this is why we we spend some time reviewing it, and uh, we were going to continue to do so. Um, if if um, yeah yeah like if if we can reach a, a good spec on quality, and we are we are committed on our side to. Uh, you know, put in during the time to provide the required feedback, and if we can reach a spec that is of good quality, we can be sure that ABC is going to implement it, like, you know, as per, as per the spec. It's really important for multi-client uh, protocols to have a good, solid, formal specification that fully specifies all the elements uh, that uh, implementations need to follow for the protocol. And uh, it's often really hard to write a spec without having written an implementation. So often people will write a test or example implementation in parallel with the spec, and that's what they're using right now. And that's totally cool, um, but you, that doesn't scale. You can only have one sample implementation being written uh, in parallel with the spec. And before uh, XT implements graphene or SD or ABC, uh, we have to have a nailed down spec so that we know how to interoperate. Who did you say is doing that now, Jonathan? Um, oh, uh, okay. Bitcoin Unlimited. Bitcoin Unlimited is actively developing a test yeah, implementation. Just, just for graphing, though, no, right? Not for like, yeah. yeah, so they're collaborating yeah. with uh, the University of Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. And, and so there are, there are people like uh, George PCS from the University of Massachusetts that, that are working on that. And they are working with the BU to get it implemented in BU and get the spec out there. Okay. Any further comments on that? We'll move on to the next question. This question came in by email, so I've just typed it in. Um, do you think zero conf as currently implemented is too insecure for real world usage? If so, what changes do you think need to be made to ensure zero comp reliability? Uh, I can speak to that. It really depends on your risk profile, right? So uh, first, if you are some, some online website, for instance, you don't really care about zero comp. Settling in 10 minutes is uh, plenty enough because you are not going to ship something within 10 minutes, so you can cancel the order if the payment doesn't arrive. Face-to-face uh, -face payment of small amount is uh, also probably okay. Uh, but as the amount get higher, then it becomes less okay. And how high you can go really depends on your risk tolerance. Uh, that being said, there is no reason to not improve zero conf if we have opportunity to improve it. Um, um, uh, it would be very bizarre to say, okay, it's not 100% secure, but it's secure enough, so we're never going to improve it. Um, it's, it's not a very good attitude, especially since I think many people in the BCH community tend to overestimate or secure zero conf R. Right now, it's possible to double spend zero conf um, with a reliability of somewhere between 20 and 25%. So it's not like you know 100% chance of doing it, but within 10 minutes you can double spend with a probability of, of 20, 25% if you use the right techniques. So someone is probably not gonna do it when it, they buy a sandwich for a few euros, right? But someone may definitively do that if they buy a TV at some electronics shop, right? For a, a few hundred euros. Um, so so I, I think this number is um, needs to be worked on, and especially since it has implication in scaling. Um, 
which like people may not realize how the two are actually intertwined, but if you can decide what goes in the next block or not, like with a high degree of certainty before the block is found, then you can leverage that partial information of what the next block is going to look like to speed up the block propagation and validation. So um, if our nodes can communicate and say, OK, this transaction is correct, this transaction is not correct, and, and, and come to an agreement on that, then each of our node is going to have a very similar set of transactions ready to go in the next block. So there is, there is a whole set of idea there. It's a very active field of research. I think the, the most interesting, the most interesting step forward that has been done recently is the discovery of the Avalanche protocol, which is essentially a way for not to negotiate a set of transactions to be, to be included in the next block. Or, or just to be like, oh, actually what they propose in the Avalanche paper is not even app blocks which I don't, think is, is, um, I don't think is the best option, but I, we can definitely like, combine the both approaches. So you get you know, much higher reliability on zero conf, and at the same time, it expands the, the, the scaling capability of the whole network. So we definitely want to work on that. And even if you don't really care about zero conf, um, you may want to care for the scaling aspect of it. Thank you. Uh, we, we have a conference coming up too. I don't know. I had to grab my charger. I don't know if I already mentioned it, but um, in a couple of weeks uh, where I guess we're going to try and talk about some of this stuff, it's it, to the question, is it reliable enough now? I mean, for certainly for like what we'd like to see it be used for, for like retail transactions and that sort of stuff, probably not, but there's, um, there's kind of two things that need to be addressed is the, you know, you have the, um, the person who just kind of relays two conflicting transactions on the network. And that's probably the easier attack to address. Um, and who, I think the only thing stopping it right now is we haven't had agreement on how to address it, but hopefully we can get that agreement in this conference. We'll see. But um, the, the other is what Amory mentioned, where <clears throat> if the miners are, if someone kind of wants to bribe a miner, um, that's the way around, you know, our, the way we would try and stop the attack. You can get around that just by going right to the miners and bribing them. And that's where maybe something like pre-consensus can change the incentives a little bit. Okay. Um, anybody else like to comment on the zero conf question? Hearing no, I'll move on to the next question. Is, 100, is 128 megabyte limit on ABC's roadmap? Jason. Um, so technically, yes, but I would like to point out that our roadmap includes uh, a fi far loftier goal. Uh, we've, we've talked a number of times about shooting for one terabyte blocks. Now, exactly like where that lands in the future, it's probably you know years out from now, but uh, that that's kind of where we're shooting towards. Uh, I would I would like to see one twenty eight megabyte limit uh, raised uh, appropriately. I, I, we can't, I don't know if we have a really a exact date. I, it could be the, the May hard fork if uh, nothing uh, improvements occur in time. Seems a little unlikely given our current velocity, but the hard fork after the May hard fork is a very real possibility. Uh, and we may even go higher than that, like rather than you know hitting for 128, it's possible we could hit 256 or 512. It's really hard to say at this point in time. Um, but our, our ultimate goal is one terabyte blocks because that's, that's what we've determined is necessary for worldwide scale. Thank you, Jason. Anybody else want to speak on the 128 limit? Yeah, I mean, it has to happen after benchmarks showing that the software can handle it without uh, perverse incentives, without um, widespread uh, accidental selfish mining and without uh, the probability of uh, lots of nodes uh, just losing consensus. Um, the, the limit is a safety feature. It is not intended to be a economic feature. Um, and currently the limit is, uh, what, 300 times higher than average usage. Um, we want to increase that further, but we, we want to make sure that we still have that safety uh, feature in place to make sure that if something goes wrong, the 
extent to which it goes wrong can be limited to what we've tested that the system can handle. Thank you, Jonathan. Anyone else? All right. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we saw during the, the last stress test that we, like it's actually very difficult to actually generate 32 meg block. We have some tests that do it, but like in live situation, there is a lot of bottleneck that make it difficult. And so what would happen if you raise the block size right now, you just increase your attack surface because there is a lot more, like there is a lot of different attacks that you can make worse if the node accepts a bigger block size. However, you get nothing good of it, right? You get nothing good of it because in normal condition, uh, we actually fail to generate a block that big and propagate a block that big. And, and even, even like before getting close to 32 meg, we have serious issues. So uh, uh, essentially it's a bit reckless, right? Like you, um, you increase your attack surface and you get nothing. From an economic perspective, um, so from a technical perspective, the more you increase the block size and the more attack surface that you have. From an economic perspective, if the block size is below market demand, then you get all kind of perverse effect. And if it's above market demand, you get no effect. I detailed the reasoning of that in, um, in my presentation where I announced Bitcoin ABC in NM, if some people want to look that up. But essentially, when you study the economic impact of the limit, this is what you see. So, if there was a way to know what is the exact market demand, you would, you would want the limit to be just above that, right? So if the market demand is uh, 10, you'd like the limit to be 11, right? Like ideally, but there is no way in practice to know what is the actual market demand. So you want to have, you want to have a fix, uh, you want to have like enough margin, right? But right now the margin is, is um, more than a hundred times market demand. So we are, uh, we are safe there. And so we have the time to do things properly to make sure that the technical problem that arise when you make it bigger can be fixed before, before we increase it without risking uh, all the perverse uh, economic effect of running into the limit. Um, quick response to Murray's comments. Uh, so the main thing that prevented us from getting to 32 megabytes uh, during the September 1st stress test has been fixed. If the stress test were done right now, we probably would see uh, several 32 megabyte blocks and possibly even a chain of 32 megabyte blocks. Um, and second point that Amari made uh, was that all that matters is that the block size limit is above uh, the market demand. And that's technically true, but there are other reasons why that's false. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the block size limit is a social signaling. Um, it is a sign from the developer community, from the miners, and from the old users to future users that they are welcome here and that we want them here. Um, so we do try to keep the block size limit well above market demand, and that's why uh, the increase to 32 megabytes was made. Uh, we want to keep that signaling uh, going on. We want to keep uh, people aware that um, that we want them to come and that uh, if, you know, a sudden load comes onto the system, uh, we will hire more engineers and we will make these performance fixes faster um, so that we can handle them. Um, but there's a limit to, to uh, how fast we should be increasing that limit in the absence of those performance fixes. And uh, for now, 32 megabytes is uh, the limit for how fast we should do it. Maybe in May, um, we might be able to do 128 megabytes. Probably in November of next year, we will be able to do at least 128, if not more. We have a lot of changes in the pipeline that we just need to finish. Um, ATMT uh, parallelization, we need to do uh, graphene and or extender to improve block propagation. Um, those two will, should alone should actually uh, get us at least 128, as long as they are um, tested and, unlike my current code, don't crash. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so we just need to... Uh, a little bit of patience and not rush into things before we're ready for it. And uh, unfortunately, that's what SB is trying to do right now. Okay. And, uh, I, I wish to add something if, if possible. Yes, go ahead. please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just, it's very short. I just wish to be very clear. Uh, it's not a matter of hardware. You can spend $30,000 in a server and basically the validation will work slower than in a basic 
game a machine. So uh, it's not about money, it's about we need to do some modifications before. That's it. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, I agree. I just wanted to also emphasize, like I agree with what Jonathan was saying, like the focus, like we want to give the signal to people that, yeah, we, we want big blocks and we want to have big scaling. But the way to do that, I think, I, I think is to focus on the technical issues that need to be fixed to enable that, you know, just not just increasing a number for show. So if we want to credibly say, yeah, we're welcoming everyone to come onto here and we want to scale massively, our focus should be on, on fixing all these bottlenecks and having a credible plan um, for scaling well into the future. Thank you, Anthony. Any further comments? <clears throat> Hearing none, I'll move on to the next question. <clears throat> if pruning the chain as in the roadmap will increase anonymity significantly and whether it might conflict with any L2 apps, thanks. I just read it as it was, so if you guys could take a look, maybe you could understand the question better than I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what that question is referring to. Mm. I'd say we skip that one. It doesn't seem to follow. I, I, I mean, I think this, if this were a block, um, our nodes would reject it. Okay. All right, we'll move on from that one. Um, the next question that I have lined up is, <clears throat> give me a half a second. Um, microtransactions will be very important for BCH. What ABC developments are being worked on to handle lower fees, sub satoshis, transactions, dust, etc. So um, I've I've been working on the fee code uh, uh, pretty pretty much for the last couple of months. Um, unfortunately, it's not not as simple as just dropping. Uh, the minimum relay fee to say 100 uh, sats per kilobyte. Um, a, a lot of the test suite starts failing. Um, there's some rounding errors with fee calculations in the wallet. Um, so I fixed most of those issues. Um, the other issue that you run into is that um, if you drop the fees substantially, um, it becomes very cheap to generate UTXOs. And those are the primary thing that costs miners money at this point. Um, so a number of mine. Um, so hash rate is going to be. But sure. Sure. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, of course, hash rate is it's always <laughs> more expensive, but um, uh, level DB is definitely um, you know, eventually a bottleneck. And to generate an UTXO becomes much cheaper to do when you change the fee structure or change the fees. Um, so yeah, once, once those things are addressed, um, I think that we can actually uh, drop the fees even more. Um, so as a miner, I've looked into the optimal minimum fee that a miner should accept for a transaction. And it turns out there's a relatively simple formula for this. Um, and all it depends on is the block reward in Bitcoin and cash, uh, you know, BCH units, and the block propagation velocity. Um, it does not depend on DTXO size, at least until DTX size, DTXO set size increases to the point where it starts to significantly delay block propagation. Um, currently, uh, at a block propagation speed of uh, one megabyte of uncompressed block size per second, uh, from the first miner to the last miner, the uh, optimal uh, rational fee to use uh, as a minimum acceptable fee for miners is coincidentally about one Satoshi per byte. Um, this is also uh, pretty much exactly the, the median fee on Bitcoin Cash. Um, I can't say for certain that other miners are following this, uh, this formula and are actually sophisticated enough to calculate it um, in order to determine that one Satoshi per byte is the minimum that they should be accepting, but I know that's what I've done. Um, I will not uh, reduce my uh, minimum acceptable fee below one Satoshi per byte um, until block propagation performance improves. And 
once block propagation performance improves, which might be in a few months, then that rational point is going to change, it's going to decrease. So the uh, miners will probably start to accept smaller fees at that point. Uh, something else that happens is that when the block reward changes, this is kind of counterintuitive, and actually I'm not particularly happy about it, that when the block reward changes, the uh, results of this calculation also changes. So if at the next halving, the rational fee for a miner to accept is going to get cut in half. Um, I'm personally worried about this because I think that there should be uh, a little bit more of an incentive for uh, people to overpay on fees in order to be able to, to support miners after the uh, rock subsidy is effectively zero. Um, so I'm hoping that people will uh, voluntarily, out of the goodness of their heart and for the sake of Bitcoin Cash as a whole, uh, choose not to use ridiculously low fees whenever they you know, can afford it. They're sending a $5 transaction. Um, I think that people should voluntarily include a one cent fee for miners, for example. Um, I don't know if that's good enough. Uh, this is currently a non solved problem. Uh, in my but uh, yeah, just improving performance is going to reduce the minimum fees. And that's what we're working on. So even though we're not working directly on fees, we're still working indirectly on fees. Thank you, Jonathan. Any further comments on the question? Chris, you've got, I'm uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but um, you have some experience with uh, transactions in general um, with, uh, I want to call it OB1. Um, <laughs> Do you have a, um, uh, any comments on uh, microtransactions and the, the fees? Um, not in particular. We don't, we don't really have much of a need for like microtransactions in Open Bazaar. I, I will just say, I mean, it's a lot. I don't know if the, fee, the whole fee thing has ever really been, um, if we've ever come up with a really great solution, but just having more stable fees like we have in Bitcoin cash makes it a lot easier to write code than in Bitcoin where the fees can be changed from hour to hour. Um, we have to, with Bitcoin, we have to hit like a centralized API to get fees, um, which is certainly not ideal when you're trying to build a, a light wallet. So I, I should have clarified open bazaar uses a, a light wallet. So it's not <clears throat> able to estimate fees by itself. So when you have, uh, you know, when I can just kind of hard code a fee per byte and know that it's always going to go through on the network, that makes it a lot easier to, to write code for than when you have to use a centralized service to get your fees. Thank you, Chris. And sorry to put you on the spot like that. That's all right. All right, next question. <clears throat> um, uh, when is ABC going to implement BIP70 so we can easily pay BitPay invoices? Honestly, uh, someone is going to have to do it. Like we don't have the engineering bandwidth with at the time, but we'd be uh, we'd be thrilled to get a patch for it. But um, yeah. When is BitPay going to task one of their developers to implement their uh, basically proprietary uh, protocol for ABC? I think that you know, if they want to do that, if they want to make something that nobody else uses except for uh, BitPay, then it's in their interest to write the code for it. Um, if we had time to uh, do it ourselves, we probably would, but we just have bigger fish to fry. It might be something I, I might work on in the, the BCHD. I think my, I have a little bit different strategy for that one than let's say ABC is, um, as far as like the scalability stuff, I, I, I kind of just want to let other people work on that and then figure out what's best. And then, you know, when, when it's needed, eventually get around to implementing it in, in the BCHD, but that would allow me to work on other things like that BIP 70 and, and other kind of cool features. Um, so uh, that, that is something I think would be on my priority to put it in there. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Any other comments? <clears throat> no, but I'd, I'd like to reiterate, if we get a patch that is of good quality, we're going to merge it, like, no, no, no problem with that, especially, but we don't have to, we don't have to engineering bandwidth at this point in time to do it also. All right, thank you. Um, next question, perhaps a little bit of a different take. Um, why did BC, why did ABC argue against using Nakamoto consensus as the governance model for BCH 
in the upcoming fork at the Bangkok meeting? Because it doesn't work. Uh, Nakamoto consensus would work for a soft fork, but not for a hard fork. Um, you can't use a hash war to resolve this issue. Um, if you have different hard forking rule sets, you're going to have a persistent chain split no matter what uh, the hash rate distribution is. So, um, you know, and I don't think, I don't know, whether or not we are uh, willing to use Nakamoto consensus to resolve issues is not the issue right here. What the issue is that it's just technically impossible. Yeah, I would like to address that in, in a bit of a different way. Um, so first, yes, if you have an incompatible, uh, incompatible change set, you get a permanent change speed no matter what, right? No matter. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, also, I, I think Nakamoto consensus is, um, is probably quite misunderstood. Uh, people people sh would do well to actually reread the we read the right paper on that front. Um, and so the, the, what the Nakamoto consensus describe uh, generally is going to be minor starting to enforce different rule set and uh, everybody's going to reorg into the longest chain, right? And this is, oh, you can decide among change set that are compatible with each other because if they are not compatible with each other, nobody's going to rework into any chain and what you get is two chain and Nakamoto consensus cannot, um, cannot resolve that. Uh, also, another idea that people have a lot with Nakamoto consensus is that uh, minor vote, and this is all we decide uh, what goes in the chain, but this is not what is described in the white paper. What is described as voting in the white paper is minor vote for a chain by choosing to extend it, right? So any block they find on the chain and, and extend the chain count as a vote as described in the white paper. And uh, um, this is actually a vote and a good decision mechanism because this is costly and, and binding for the miner to do so because the block that the miner is gonna uh, found that way is not gonna be valid under another rule set, right? So effectively the miner is committing to that chain. However, this is not the case when voting ahead of time, which is not what is described by uh, Nakamoto consensus. Uh, the vote ahead of time is non-binding, and then you get to problem that Jonathan uh, uh, described earlier, is that you can have a big actor that move a ton of hash rate on BCH for uh, some period of time for the duration of the vote and then leave again and let everybody deal with the consequences of that vote. So. Uh, we are in the position where uh, we cannot really do the hash rate vote stuff. And also uh, we are in the position where a lot of people are confused between this whole hash rate vote and what Nakamoto consensus is actually described in the white paper. So uh, um, yeah, I think people would do good to like reread those two parts of the white paper because they are actually quite insightful and, and widely misunderstood. Yeah, Nakamoto consensus in the white paper is about determining which of several uh, valid histories uh, of transaction ordering is the true canonical uh, ordering and which uh, transactions are approved and confirmed and which ones are not. It is not for determining uh, which rule set uh, determines uh, the validity. You cannot use Nakamoto consensus, for example, to decide whether the 21 million Bitcoin limit is uh, good or bad. You can't just say, okay, but I have 10 times as much hash rate that says you should be paying miners 10 times more because it's not up to the miners to make that decision. The only decision that uh, uh, Nakamoto consensus is allowed to make on is which of the various uh, uh, types of blocks or block uh, contents that would be valid according to the rule set is the true uh, 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 history. So, yeah, I think there's just a misunderstanding there about what Nakamoto consensus is. All right. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And uh, I think this is probably a good point to wrap things up for today. We're at the top of the second hour. So um, as well, we've been here for two hours. Um, I want to thank you all the participants as the panelists for this meeting today and opportunity to speak both in front of the participants and also in front of the video audience 
And uh, again, thank you all very much uh, for your participation today. Um, look forward to seeing you all again soon.